If you have your Bibles, will you turn with me this morning to Genesis chapter 13? Just hold it there, and I promise you we're going to get there. Feel like we've feel like we've already had church. We could just go home now. I, that was a beautiful moment in the altar a while ago. I, I don't feel even kind of strange now. I was caught up in something. I don't know really what to tell you, but I. I just felt like I could smell the fragrance of Jesus. Anybody know what that smells like? He's the lily of the valley. That's what I was thinking of in the altar. The valley's a low place. We think of the valley of the shadow of death. We think, if I'm going through a valley, somebody says, brother, I'm just going through a valley. Sister, I just feel like I'm in a valley. You're, you're in a low place. You just feel like, you know, you're just low. But Jesus is the lily of the valley you can just smell that and that that smell lets you know i'm coming out of this valley amen i'm gonna make it i'm, I'm gonna find freedom uh, i'm gonna find victory and and i i could just see you know i had my eyes closed but i was just picturing jesus in heaven in his his royal royalty you know that's the king he sits on the throne in his power and in his majesty and for a moment, I don't know if it's just my own mind or the enemy that would say, you can't touch him, you can't get close to him. Then I remembered what Hebrews says, he can be touched, amen? You can get there, you can smell his aroma. Nothing like being in the presence of Jesus. So good to have my cousin Jeremy and his family with us this morning. He called me a couple weeks ago and said, I'm burning, amen, amen, I'm burning with the fire of God in my heart. That's a good call to get, amen. Can we give the Lord praise for that? <laughs> praise the Lord. So we're just so happy. We're blessed people, amen. God's moving, y'all. This is the hour for revival. This is the hour to move with God. This is the hour. If you're going to do something for God, do it. I mean, just like my son shared in the middle of our, our worship, where'd he go? There he is. He's trying to be a woods. <laughs> he, uh, you know, time's running out. The books are filling up. If you're going to do something for God, do it. You know, Jesus will look at people. There'll only be two camps on that day. The worst words in the scriptures that you could imagine. Depart from me, I don't know you or the greatest words that you and I could hear. Well done, you're a good and faithful servant. I have to hear that, y'all. You have to hear that. Live your life in that. Keep pressing on, it's hard. It's not a one of us here this morning if you're actively serving God. You don't have difficulties. You don't have troubles. You don't have some days where you just don't wanna do it. You don't have some days when you you feel like you're not even saved and you, you feel like God is a million miles away from you. That's the reality for every one of us, but you fight through it. You stand upon the Word of God. I love one of the songs that uh, Sister Candace sang last week, that it's time to get up and stand upon the Bible. Amen? There's a time in your life where you, you just absolutely have to stand upon the Word of God and believe Him. I want to preach a message to you this morning that's entitled The Place Where You Cannot Win. The Place Where You Cannot Win. Will you pray with me and I'm going to get into that word this morning? Father, I do thank you for your word. I thank you for your anointing that's so real, so evident this morning. And Lord, we do know that it is your anointing that destroys the heavy yoke. God, I pray today that you would anoint the reading, the preaching, and the hearing of the Word of God. Give us spiritual eyes to see and a heart to receive. Lord, let us just be willing and yielded to you that you might mold our heart. Let our heart be good ground to receive your seed, the seed of your Word. And God, we pray that it would grow and it would be fruitful and prosper in our lives. Jesus' name, amen. 
this today, what I have, is a, a warning to us as believers. I actually got this message earlier in the year, began reading through my Bible, and I got into the book of Numbers. And in the book of Numbers, you know, it's a lot of wandering, it's a lot of going nowhere, it's a lot of murmuring and a lot of complaining. And it all came about because God brought the children of Israel, some scholars say it was like three million Israelites that come out of slavery in Egypt. He brought them right to the brink of the promised land in a place called Kadesh Barnea. And they sent spies over into the land, going to see about the land that God promised to give them, a good land, a land flowing with milk and honey. But you know, they got over there and they did find a cluster of grapes as big as a man's head. They found fruits and pomegranates. They found wonderful things, everything that God promised. But when they come back, their hearts were full of unbelief. Their hearts were full of uh, impossibilities. We were like grasshoppers in the sight of the giants in that land, and there's no way. And God said, okay, turn around. You're going back into the wilderness. And for the next 40 years, they wandered in circles, and they never went anywhere. And they ended up in, in places where they were overrun by the enemy. They ended up in places where they didn't have food to eat or water to drink. They ended up in places where a whole camp, a whole tribe of people would begin to murmur and say, we're going back to Egypt. And God literally caused the ground to open up and swallow entire families of people. And you know, as I'm listening to that and I'm reading that in my Bible, I thought, you know what? You never should have been there. Have you ever ended up in a place where you're like, man, I, I shouldn't even be here. If I, if I would have done the right thing, if, if I would have listened to God, if I would have stuck with the plan, if I would have stuck with the right people, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be facing this. I wouldn't be in this pit. I wouldn't be feeling this pain. I wouldn't be in this misery. And that's really where this message comes from. There are places that you get to in your life if you refuse to heed the Word of God, the warnings of God, and walk with the people of God, you can actually end up in a place where you cannot win. The Bible says in Colossians 1.28, the Apostle Paul, I'm going to read this to you. I want you to hold your place in Genesis 13. That is where we're going. But the Apostle Paul was speaking of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.28 says, Whom we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom that we might present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. Understand, all through the Word of God, there's preaching, there's teaching, but there's also warning. There's a lot of warning in the Word of God. Because just like there's a real Christ, there's an Antichrist. Just like there is a Holy Spirit this world is full of evil spirits, demon spirits, seducing spirits, deceiving spirits. And you need to know the dangers in this world. There's a real devil. There's a real hell. And there are real consequences to sin. There's real consequences to backsliding. There's real consequences to disobeying the Word of God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2.14... It says, thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. You know what that means? That no matter the situation that you're in, the difficulty that's in your family, the difficulty that's in your life, the sickness that's in your body, God is able to come through Jesus Christ in every situation, in every circumstance, and give you victory and spread the fragrance of Jesus. He will help you no matter where you are. Don't you sit there and wish, boy, I, I wish I was like them, or I wish I had it like them, or I wish I had that family or that job. The devil will get you caught up in daydreaming or looking over the fence 
at your neighbor's grass and you'll never pour in the work, the effort, and you'll never have the faith that God's going to meet you right where you are. Listen, I can't tell you how many times we were preaching to four or five people and I would go, so some of you this week, you went to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. You went to First New Testament Church. Probably, I believe, the best church on the, on, in, in the United States of America. I love it there. And I used to go there uh, sometimes when I could get a break from, from preaching to four or five people. And I'd go, and I would just sit there and I would weep. The first time I ever went to that church, I, I sat in the pew and I cried and I cried and I cried. And I said, God, this is what I want for my family. This is what I want for my wife. This is what I want for my sons and my daughters. This is what I want for the people of Eupora, Mississippi. And there were times, you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to move to Baton Rouge. I was wondering if I could make it in the city. I, I like to have a lot of room and no neighbors where I can do what I want to do out in my yard. Amen? I don't know if I could make it in Baton Rouge. Then I'd go to other places and I'd think, man... What, I'll, maybe I'll just come here. But you know what I roll back to every time? God, why don't you do it right here? Why can't you do it in you poor Mississippi? Why can't you do it in my life? And you know what? I've seen, I've seen God give us the victory. I've seen God spread the, fa the fragrance and the sweet savor of Jesus Christ in the same spirit that works in Baton Rouge, Louisiana is the Spirit of God that works at 1605 Adams Avenue, Eupora, Mississippi. God did it. God did it. <laughs> And you believe and you plant and you water and you labor and you keep going. Even when it don't seem like nothing's happening, God is working on your behalf. Every place God can break through in your life and turn it around. But what I want to talk to you about this morning is there are places that the people of God have wandered into. And in those places, you cannot win. Why can't I win there? The Bible says God will give me victory everywhere. The, God, the Bible says God has spread the fragrance of Jesus in every place. The reason you can't win there is because God did not tell you to go there. The reason there's no victory for you there is because that's not God's plan. You know what we do a lot of times? We pray after the fact. We don't see God and say, God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to be? Where would you plant me? Young people, God, who do you want me to marry? God, where do you want me to work? Where do you want me to live? God, is it your will that I buy this? Are you going to make sure I have the provision in my life to pay for this? A lot of times we don't do that. We just try to get God to bless our plans. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. That means God is actually directing your steps. And you are blessed because you're where God wants you to be. And you're doing what God wants you to do. But a lot of times we go out and do what we want to do. And when it don't start working, it, when it starts to, we start to realize it ain't working out. God help me. Where are you? You said I, you direct my steps. That's way back there, right? And you'll wander into a place where God didn't want you to be. In Genesis 13, where I ask you to turn to, this is the story of Abraham, and it's the story of Lot. A lot of you know this. Maybe some of you don't. Abraham, in chapter 12, just one chapter before, Abraham was an idol maker. His daddy was an idol maker. His grandfather was an idol maker. That's all he knew. As in, they would go out into the woods or out into the field and get a piece of wood or a piece of stone, and they would carve into it the image of what they thought God was like. They were in a land called the Ur of the Chaldeans. That means... That, well, what it is, is Babylon. 
You know, if you know about Bible prophecy, if you know the story of uh, uh, Babylon is the seat of false religion. One day it will be restored and it will be the headquarters of a man named Antichrist. It's an evil place. Near there was the Garden of Eden where the devil first deceived man. It's a place where there's a deep-rooted satanic stronghold. There's a great demonic principality that rules there. That's where Abraham is. But a miracle occurred there. God spoke to Abraham. Abraham heard God's voice and God said, Abraham, I want you to leave everything and everybody you know and get to a land that I'll show you. And a miracle happened. That man put down his idols, he packed up his bags, and he went not knowing where he was going. You know what Abraham is called in the scriptures? The father of faith. He's going to have a blessed line. God would come and appear and say, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He is the father of faith. God promised him, through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God said in the night sky, Abraham, go out and look at the stars. Those are going to be your sons and your daughters. He's an old man. His wife is past the days of childbearing. Abraham said, God, I don't know how or I don't know when, but I'll put one foot in front of the other and I will go where you lead me. And he goes and he begins to move with God. He has a nephew named Lot. Lot don't know God. Lot don't know the Word of God. But somewhere along the trail, that uncle, wouldn't it be great to have an uncle like this? Nephew, I heard the voice of God. Come on and go with me. We're going to a blessed land. Put that idol down, man. I'm going to introduce you to the real and the living God. And he's blessed me. He's given me a word. And if you go with me, he'll bless you too. He'll give you words. So they begin to move together. They begin to go with God. By the time you get to chapter 13, listen to this. It says, Abraham went up out of Egypt. I just want to stop right there and say, not that nobody does this perfectly. We're talking about pursuing the will of God and being where you want to be. Abraham's moving with God. He's in the land God wants him to be. And then there arose a famine. Let me tell you, if you're following God, there will be difficulty and there will be hardship in your life. But that's not time to abandon ship. It's not time to look for an exit door or it's not time to go to plan B. It's time to just hold on and endure. And it won't feel good, but it will work something good inside of you. And you know what God will build in your life? A testimony. You're sitting with a broken heart this morning. I don't know why that happened. I don't know why it didn't work out. I don't know why I had to go through that. You just give it time and you walk through that and you allow God to heal your broken heart. You're going to sit with others who have a broken heart and real living water, real ministry is going to begin to pour out of you and it will all make sense now. God, you helped me. You allowed me to walk through that so that I could lead other people. The devil's trying to choke people to death, but thank God there's somebody with a testimony of life. I walked through the valley of the shadow of death and I'm alive today with a testimony of life and power and victory. And if he helped me, brother, if he helped me, sister, he won't leave you there to die. That's why you go through difficulties. That's why you go through hard times because God is building something real in your life. Abraham left during the famine. He went to Egypt. Egypt in the scripture, it's always a type of the world. We start looking to them. I knew not to fool with them. I knew not to call them. I knew not to ask. Every time I fool with you, right? Look into the world. You didn't pray about it. You got on that phone and called three carnal people, and now you got you a plan, right? Get in trouble. Abraham goes down there. He lies down there. That ain't my wife. That's my sister. <laughs> Gets in trouble. Look in chapter 13. Abraham got out of Egypt with his wife and all he had, and Lot with him, and, and they went into the south. 
Abraham was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south even to Bethel, listen to this, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai. Thank God for second chances and new beginnings. If you missed it and you went to Egypt, who hadn't done it? Don't die in Egypt. Get up and go back to where you were. That's where Abraham goes. Look in verse 4. Unto the place of the altar which he made there at the first. And Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Abraham went back to the altar. You see, in church culture, culture we've made the altar just a place where bad people go, right? Somebody goes to the altar, they're crying. Oh, what'd they do? Right? It's not what it is. The altar is the place where the people of faith, where people of God go to call on the name of the Lord. The altar is a place of power. It's a place where I'm looking for help. It's a place where I'm worshiping. It's a place where I might just be there to give thanks. It might be a place where I'm bleeding out because I had a bad week and I need the good Samaritan to come pour in some oil and the wine. You come to the altar and you won't be worried why they come to the altar. God will be helping you. Abraham gets back to the place he was at the beginning. He says a place called Bethel. You know what Bethel means? The house of God. That's what Bethel means. You remember Jacob uh, used that rock for a pillow? And he had a dream in the night of a ladder going to heaven and people ascending to heaven and coming back down. He got up in the morning and he poured oil on the rock and called the name of that place Bethel, the house of God, the rock he rested his head on. is a picture of our rock, our solid foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he poured a little oil on top of it, a type of the Holy Spirit. That's what the church, the house of God, ought to be, a solid foundation where the oil flows. Jacob named that place Bethel. Right between Bethel and a place called Hai. You know what Hai means? A heap of ruins. There's a place called Bethel. That's the house of God. That's where I'm going. Right? In, in, in many types and pictures we are that. The temple of God by the Spirit today. David said, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's where I'm going, to my father's house. Over here in Hai is a heap of ruins. You know what that is? That's destruction. That's loss. I believe it's a type of hell. You know what's right in the middle of it? The Bible says right between it. There's an altar that a man who believes God built Right between the house of God and a place of destruction and ruin, there's an altar that a man of God built and he's calling on the name of the Lord. You know what I believe that altar is? That Old Testament altar is a picture of the New Testament cross. That means the only thing standing between mankind getting to the house of God and not going to a place of ruin, destruction, and eternal hell is the blood-stained cross of Jesus Christ. That's what it represents. That's where the men of God, they cling to it. It's a safe place. It's a secure place. The Bible goes on to say that In verse 5, Lot had a lot of flocks and so on and so forth. Verse 6, the land wasn't able to keep them together for their substance was great. Verse 7, there was strife between Abraham's men and Lot's men. Beware that you don't let strife move you out of the place that God wants you to be. Strife means contention. It means disagreement. It means you just rubbed me the wrong way. You offended me. I've got a problem with you. Every time when it comes, it wasn't God that does that. God always brings unity with his children. I've never told my son, go hit your brother. I've never told my daughter to go slap your brother. You know what I want? I want unity in my house. That's what the father wants. But what the devil wants to do, he sees these two men, they're blessed, they're mighty, they're moving towards God. Let's just put a little friction in there. Somebody said something. 
It got back to you. Now you feel some type of, you better be very careful that you don't allow strife to move you out of the place that God wants you to be. Listen, it goes on to say, verse 8, Abraham says, I don't want any strife. Verse 9, go where you want to go. If you go left, I'll go right. If you go right, I'll go left. If you want the north, I'll head south. I'll go anywhere. Verse 10, Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan. It's well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And it was like the garden of the Lord. Boy, it looks good, don't it? It's like the land of Egypt when you come to Zoar. Listen to this. The word Sodom means burning. The word Gomorrah, it actually means submerging. Submersion. You're sinking. You're going down. It looks good. But how many of you know it ain't what it looks like? Right? You ever, you ever thought something was a good thing, but it ends up, it's, it's actually not a good thing, it's a bad thing, and you get over there and the veneer wears off of it, and it's not what you thought it was, you were deceived. Listen, it goes on to say in verse 12 that Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and he pitched his tent towards Sodom, verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. That's a bad place. You know what Sodom is? It's a place where you can't win. There's no victory over there, Lot. There's no blessing over there. There's no prosperity over there. It's not what you think it is. It's actually deception. He goes on, the, the Lord spoke to Abraham in verse 14, and he said, look up, and everywhere you see, verse 15, that's the land I'm going to give you. Verse 16, I'll make your seed like the dust of the earth. If a man can number dust, then your children can be numbered. Rise up and walk through the land the length of it, the breadth of it, and I'm going to give it to you. Verse 18, Abraham removed his tent and came in the, in the, to dwell in the plain of Mamre, which is Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Do you see the difference, y'all? One man looked up and said, I need what's best for me right now. I need grass for my cows and I need water. You know what Abraham said? I need God. Lot went to Sodom. Abraham went and he built an altar. Lot goes to Sodom. That's a place where you can't win. Why not? Because that's not the will of God for you. You know what I think should have happened in this moment? Lot should have been willing to get rid of some cows, get rid of some goats. Because you don't need cows and goats. If you've ever had either one, you know you don't need them. You need God. You need to cling to Him. What I've noticed with so many people, man, you try to hold on to everything in your life. You're going to end up losing what's most important. God ends up back somewhere back there on the back burner. And you're trying to corral your cows and your goats. And every day you're drifting further and further and further away from God. Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. You keep reading through the Bible, guess what? He sat at the gate of Sodom. You know what that means? He's the mayor of Sodom. He's an important politician in the city of Sodom. In man's eyes, he's great, but God told us in verse 14, the men there are sinners, and they're wicked exceedingly before the Lord. Lot, that is not where I want you to be. You know what a thought I had this week? Far too often, we depend upon the mercy of God to rescue us when we know we're taking the wrong path. I don't mean in any way to belittle the mercy of God. Without God's mercy, mercy means you did not get what you deserved. There's not a person in here that hasn't tasted the mercy of God. Without God's mercy, we'd be lost. 
many of us would be in hell instead of being in church this morning. God says, though, in his word that obedience, to obey is better than sacrifice. You know, it's better to hear the word of God and do and go the direction that he asks you to go than it, ends, than it is to end up saying, God, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. Please come and rescue me. Far too often we depend on the mercy of God even when we know that we're going the wrong way. God says obedience is better than sacrifice. You know what you better know? You better know what God's Word says to you. David says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus said, if you believe upon me, you will not walk in darkness, but you shall have the light of life. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul and he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You better be sure that you know what the Word of God says to you. You fathers, you better make sure you know what God says to you about leading your family, about having a godly marriage and raising godly children. You men and women better fight for your marriage and protect your marriage and lead your children to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't just say, well, God's merciful. Oh, he'll forgive us. Oh, we, we ain't going to stay in Sodom long. We'll, we'll be back. I'm just going to do this for a little while, and I'm going to get what I want, and then I'll be back. It never works like that. The devil will see to it. You get promoted in Sodom. Let me tell you something this morning. Not every open door is the will of God for you to walk through it. I know that the devil can actually come and present to you something similar to what you've been praying for. I know that the devil can present in front of you an opportunity that's very close to what you've been asking God to do for you, to open that door for you, or to bring that into your life. And it takes great discernment and it, 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 it takes great dependency upon God. It takes the fear of God to be operating and active in your life that I would rather displease people, I would rather let people down than I would get out of the will of God. I believe Lot should have got rid of some animals and stuck with Abraham. Because there's always a price tag that comes with sin. It'll always cost you. And not only will it cost you, it'll cost the people around you. God's mercy came. Angels came. They said, Lot, you got to get out of here. God's about to destroy this city. Lot had lived there so long and just adapted to the people around him. He went to go try to tell his family, we got to get out of here. God's going to judge this city. You know what they thought? They thought he was making a joke. I've never heard them talk this way. Let me ask you. If you went home today and told your family, we got to get our house in order. Because Jesus is coming. And he's going to take a bunch of people home with him, people that have been saved and born again, people that walk with God. 
people whose names are written down in the Lamb's book of life. He's coming and he's going to take people home with him in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and we got to get ready. Y'all, we've been doing this and we've been doing that and we let all this come. We got to get rid of that and you ain't going there no more and we ain't going with them no more because we're about to start serving God. Your family ever heard you talk like that before? Or would it seem strange? Lot goes and tries to tell his family, man, we got to get God is fixing to destroy this place. Guess what? They didn't move. God's mercy came. And the angels from heaven, the Bible says they grabbed Lot's hand. And they carried him out of the city to a safe place. Lot got out of there. But guess what? His wife didn't make it out. While Lot was climbing that ladder to success in Sodom, the spirit of the world, the devil, a lust for things, was putting a chokehold on his wife. His wife didn't love God. His life loved the world. Let me tell you something. There is no vacuum in this world. You know what a vacuum is? It's an empty place, a dead space that nothing occupies. God says in 1 John 2, 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, because if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. So it's your choice. Either you're going to love the world, which the Bible says the world passes away, but he that, that does the will of God will abide forever. That's your choice. If you love the world, you're going to perish with it. If you love the world, you don't love the Father. God says it. And if you love the Father, you don't love the world. You see it for what it is. Every time I've pursued that world, let me down. 2017, I had a wonderful job. And I was making a lot of money. And I saved up some money. There was a truck that I wanted to buy. And uh, it sat on the car lot for a year. And I kept watching them drop the price on it. And I called them one day. I'd go over there. Sometimes I'd be off on the weekends. I'd go over there and look at it and look through the windows on it. You know, I've been looking at this thing a long time. Well, I bought it. They told me what they'd take for it. I bought it. Not long after that, I wanted a tractor. I was so sick of having junk on our place that you couldn't use, couldn't work with. Dealing with that all my life. I wanted one, so we went and bought one to bush haul with and to work with. Man, it's something else I bought. I can't remember. Not long after that, it seemed like in one day, I lost my job. I went from making a lot of money, no money. Now that I bought all this stuff, and all through it, I had to fight to make payments, had to sell things I worked hard for to be able to pay for other things and other obligations that I bought. But you know what I learned through it all? You can't trust this world. It's all sinking sand. You belong to God. He wants his love. You love me because I blessed you. You love me because you got this or you bought that. Or do you love me because of who I am and I gave my son for you? Sent me home, put me in the floor, Brother Robert, for a long time. <laughs> And out of it comes some crazy idea. Let's start having church in the community center. That's what God does. He'll pull you away from that world. Don't love the world. It'll fail you. You know what? That truck's wore out. You know that tractor I bought? It was a piece of junk, and I got rid of it this week. Had nothing but problems with it the whole time, I'm telling you. You go by the biggest and the best. 
just a few years, you, all the lights start coming on, things start making noises that ought not be making noises, and you it'll leave you with a desire for more. You're unfulfilled. You'll never satisfy. But if you get to the table with Jesus, if you get in His presence, there's more than enough to go around. Whether you ain't got five dollars or you got five thousand dollars, it don't matter. My name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm at the altar. My family's at the altar. I'm filled with the Spirit. I'm not going to lose here. This is the place of victory because the victor is in my midst and he's in my life and he's in my presence moving with God. That's the place where you can win. Lot's wife fell in love with the world. Man, I like my nice house in Sodom. I like my big kitchen. I like my grass cut just like this. I like all my nice clothes in my closet. I like my big diamond ring. I like my car. I like my neighbors in Sodom. And as they're leaving, as the mercy of God is escorting them out of that city, she looks back. The Bible says she's turned to a pillar of salt. She didn't make it. They end up in a cave lot with his two daughters. And this is gross, but you get out of the will of God, there's no telling the depths that you will sink to. I've seen people that used to walk with God that don't walk with Him today, and they went further than they ever thought they would go into sin and darkness. Lot, through his daughters, became the father of a people called the Moabites, another people called the Ammonites. You know what they were? They were enemies to the children of God for generations and generations. You know what it is? It's a generational thing. This is what I believe about generational curses. I don't believe that if your grandfather belonged to secret society, that you got to have a prescription prayer to get that off of you. I don't, I'm not responsible for my grandfather's sins. I'm responsible for mine. But this is what I do believe about generational curses. You know, my granddaddy was this way. My daddy was this way. And I just can't help it. Or you know, everybody in my family does it. Or nobody in my family believes like that. And you pick up habits. You, you pick up your character. You pick up the way you are, and you justify it because all the rest of them are like that. If that ain't in the Bible, you don't need to be that. And just because if your granddaddy was that way, you don't have to be that way. Your dad, your granddaddy could have been full of hate. He could have been full of racism. He could have been full of pride. He could have been an atheist. But when you were born again in Christ, all of that is broken off of you. And you can be what they weren't. And you can make sure my son's not going to be that. My little girl's not going to be that. If they weren't godly, I'm going to be godly. My sons will walk with God. My grandchildren will walk with God. Should the Lord tarry, my great-grandchildren will be ministers unto the Most High God. Because somebody, somebody broke the curse. Somebody broke the chain. Somebody stepped out of that and said, that's not who I am. That's not who I'm going to be anymore. That's what's generational. You pour in, you pour God into you. You pour God into you. I can tell you. I, I see it all the time. People don't know two Bible verses. Get saved. Get in church. Get with the people of God. Put the phone down. Get the Bible out. Listen to. You. There, there are some preachers you can listen to during the week. They'll minister to your life. Instead of listening to songs about drinking beer, you can be listening to somebody 
pull the word of God into you while you're at work, while you're running that machine, while you're driving down the road. Instead of thinking about getting drunk, when you get off work, you can feel the, the mighty presence of God invading wherever you are, filling your cup. You're weeping. You're praying in the Holy Ghost. You're getting strong right there so that when you get home, you're not mad and ticked off, ready to jump down everybody's throat. You're ready to love. You're ready to pray. You're ready to pour into your family. Why would I want to do that? Because I'm changing the DNA of my family. I'm, I'm changing the trajectory of my family. We're not going downhill to the heap of ruins. We're at the altar and we're on our way to Bethel, to the house of God. That's where Abraham was. You better be careful. Better be careful that you don't let the enemy trick you into going to the place where you can't win. That's a terrible situation Lot's in. You know, the reality of it is, shouldn't have been there. Shouldn't have been there. You've got no idea the heartache and the pain that you avoided just by walking in the will of God. You ever had friends, maybe when you were younger, and they invited you to go do that, or something came up and you didn't get to go do that, and then something bad happened to all them that did go, and you're like, I'm glad I wasn't there. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad I wasn't in the car with you. What's that? I don't know. I can tell you there's a lot of places I'm glad I'm not at this morning. I want to be in the will of God. I want to be where he wants me to be. They should have been with Abraham. The Bible says that Abraham's moving his tent. He's going to different places. You know what you could have said? It's hard living with Abraham. He's always moving. He lives in tents. It's hard over there. We'd have to sell some stuff if we wanted to stay over there. Whatever it costs you to stay with God is nothing compared to the price you'll pay by taking your family to Sodom where you think your life will get easier. Listen to this. Psalms 37, 16 says, The little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. Proverbs 15, 16 says, Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble therewith. You're better off just staying, even if it's a small place or a simple place. You know what it is? A safe place. A safe place to be with God. Next place, my time's gotten away from me. I, I promise you I'm landing this plane. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, the Bible says it was time for kings to go out to war and fight. But David didn't go fight. He stayed home and sent his army to fight. And the Bible says that at evening time, he got up off his bed. I just imagine laying around being lazy all day. And he went up on the roof of the king's palace. And he's just walking, looking around, probably not looking for trouble. But you know what? He's in the place where he can't win. Because he's not where he's supposed to be. Just so happened there's a beautiful woman taking a bath on the roof of her house. And David sees her. David says, what's her name? Bring her to me. David gets her pregnant. Then David realizes she's the wife of a great soldier in Israel who's out there doing what David should have been doing. David sends for him to come go down to your house. And he thinks this man's going to go home and be with his wife and nine months later it won't nobody be scratching their head where that baby come from. But this man has great honor. And he slept on the floor outside the king's palace. And 
I ought to be out there. I know I'm not where I need to be. I need to be out there fighting. And David tries. He gets him drunk. He still won't go home and do it. He's a man with real honor, real devotion to his king. So David writes a letter. Says, put this man right here where the battle is the worst, the hardest, the hottest, the heaviest. And then pull back from him and leave him alone to fight so that he doesn't make it out. And that's exactly what happened. David thought he covered it. He went, sent God the woman, and said, she's going to be my wife, and everything's good. The last verse in that passage says, but the thing David did, it displeased the Lord. I just want to say, you know where David was? He's at the place where he can't win telling you, believers, child of God, you have to use such discretion as you walk through the, the world, as you pursue the will of God for your life, as you, as you navigate. Let me just say, there's places you can't go because in addition to knowing the Lord, you know what? Who else you need to know? Your own self. There's places I know I don't belong, Chuck. There's people I know I can't be around. Don't mean I hate them. It doesn't mean that I think I'm better than them. I just know my daddy used to have a saying, I know my place. I know my place. I know where I belong. There's places I don't need to go. Why? Because I'm trying to live for the Lord. I'm trying to raise a family for God. I've been married 12 years to my best friend. And all oh, the last thing I want to do is let my family down. I want to raise sons that are mighty. I was sitting on that speaker this morning. And my son was speaking what God put in his heart. When we were building, we were in here working this church, Robin, tearing that nasty rat doo-doo out of the ceiling god showed me i was going to sit at the back of this church and want to listen to my sons preach the gospel i did not know it be when they were eight years old i didn't know you know what that is that's worth fighting for that's worth protecting i have a marriage that's worth protecting i trust my wife i could get i could go to the moon and be gone three years the last thing i'd worry about is what's my wife doing i got a family i wouldn't trade for anything in this earth you know what that says to me and in a and more more on top of all of that i fear god i will stand before this god one day and won't ask me about my granddaddy or my daddy. It'll be about me. It'll be about the life I did. It'll live. It'll be about what I did. With the grace that he poured upon my life. And I will answer to him. And he won't play games with me. He won't say, I'm your, you're my old buddy or my old pal or understand. It'll be true or false on that day. God sent a prophet named Nathan to David's house. So there was a rich man who had a lot of sheep and a lot of money. There was a poor man that had one sheep and no money. They loved that sheep, let him in the house, played with his kids. The rich man had some friends come to visit. The rich man sent and stole that lamb from that poor man killed it, barbecued it, fed it to his friends. David gritted his teeth and said, when I find this man, I'm going to kill him. Nathan put his finger on David's chest and said, you are that man. And David knew, God knew, and David knew he was in trouble. And that's where Psalms 51 came. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew an upright spirit within me. 
Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. That's where it comes from. Part of a broken man. Let me tell you. If you'd say, that's where I'm at. I didn't listen to God. And I've got myself in a bad place. I'm at a place where I can't win. And what you need to do, turn around. Get out of there. Ask God to forgive you. Ask God to lead you out. I don't care if you've got to sell some stuff. If you've got to tell some people goodbye. If it's something in your life that keeps dragging you down, throw it in the garbage and run like the building's on fire. Well, that'll hurt. That'll cost. I don't know if I can do that, man. There'll be, you just imagine multitudes burning in the flames of hell that are going to wish they did what I just told you to do. But it's too late. There's breath in your lungs. It's not too late for you today. God will lead you to a place of victory, a place where it's safe place where it's secure a lot of times we get out on a limb trying to get a little bit more then the limb cracks and we fall and all bruised up and banged up should have just stayed where God wanted us to be amen would you stand with me this morning just want you to take a moment today Think about the steps you're taking, direction your life is going, even the decisions that you're making. Answer this. Can you honestly say that you know to the best of your knowledge I'm in God's will for my life? And where God wants me to be I'm walking where he wants me to walk. I really believe I'm doing what he's called me to do. Hey, if you are, you ought to ask him today for strength to stay there. Just like Abraham and Lot, that devil will want to put strife in there to leave. But if you'd say, you know, I really don't feel like I am. I feel like my heart is more in love with things than it is with Jesus. Listen to me. I wouldn't warn you to condemn you. I'd warn you to say, y'all, let's get it right. Let's get back, man. I have. I've gotten on that sift, shift in sand at times in my life. That don't mean God's through with you means he wants you back and if you'll let him he'll put you right back on that solid rock and he'll restore you it'll cost you it'll hurt but i can tell you what it'll be worth it it'll be worth it why don't you search your heart today this this morning just say god i want you to lead me i want you to help me you know what you can do? You can humble yourself and say, God, I do need a shepherd for my life. Because a lot of times I don't know what to do. A lot of times I know my heart is wrong. And I don't want to be led by my feelings. I want to be led by you, God. I don't want to end up in the place I can't win. I want to be like Abraham. What it costs me, I don't care. I want to be around that altar, calling on the name of the Lord. Father, thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for every person here. God, I thank you that it is your longing, it is your desire that each one of us, God, we would stay where it's safe, we'd stay with you. Because you know what's best for us. God, I pray this morning that what we'd have is the faith of Abraham. 
leave the darkness of this world and go with you. Where are you going? I don't know. How's it going to turn out? I don't know. Then why are you going? Because God told me to. What if you mess up? God's able to help me when I fall. And He's able to keep me from falling. God, I pray for all the lots in this room. And I know there's times in my life I've been lot. And I made choices that hurt my family and the people around me. And God, we do thank you for your mercy. God, I pray if those are in here today, God, you would stir them, you would shake them, you would wake them up. Man, you need to get out of there. Man, you need to throw that down. You need to run. Ma'am, you need to run from that. Put your eyes back on Jesus because it's real, it's serious. God, I pray that we'd be caught in your will and your desire for us. God, I pray we'd understand nobody's exempt from this, just like David, an older man with so many victories and such a testimony and such a relationship with you. From the sheep field to the palace to the leader of the, the people of Almighty God. We just thought, you know, I'll take some time off here and do what I want to do. And ended up in a terrible condition. God, I pray you just plant us in your will. Let us be what you desire for us to be. In Jesus' name. God, help these people this morning. Help even those still in their seats this morning that need help, God. Speak to us and lead us. In Jesus' name.